Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is uh, Dan Genret. I am going to be talking about what it's been like building out research, uh, user research uh, for World of Warcraft, uh, specifically for Battle for Azeroth. Um, so just to kind of cover what we're going to talk about today, um, so we're going to start off with a little bit about what games user research is within QA, so it's sort of a unique perspective, potentially, um, at Blizzard. Uh, the majority of the talk is going to be about this sort of case study around uh, Battle for Azeroth. And the way, I'm gonna, the way I've structured it is uh, I have sort of three mini case studies within that, sort of like different projects that we did, and we're going to dive in deep for each one and sort of give you some insights and sort of how we approach research, what we learned, some of the experiences, what, the impact data, uh, and sort of the, the lessons from that. And then tie all those lessons into a bundle at the end, so hopefully you take away that. Uh, if not, let me know and I can help out. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, talk, the talk went a little long last time, so it, it, we, hopefully this time in Q&A. If not, please hit me up afterwards. I'm happy to talk about this. All right, let's do this. All right, so games user research and QA. So real quick, just a little quick about me. I've been doing research about 10 years. Started at Google, um, really just helped a bunch of really smart researchers do all their things. So I learned from a really amazing group of people, different types of research, different methods, different approaches. Just It was really an awesome, awesome first job. Um, that was in Seattle. Then did a, a brief stint at Expedia. Some at Divix were kind of owned everything, very startup-y. Uh, you know, you do what we, you're creating prototypes, doing all that good stuff. The last over seven years I've spent at Blizzard, um, the first five were on the Battle.net team where user research sort of started. And I want to kind of highlight, like, while I was there, we did actually do some research for the game teams, um, but it, it, uh, we weren't able to be as consistent because it wasn't our core focus, right? We were still Battle.net, which we were launching the Battle.net app, and you have shop, and you have all these different sort of aspects of Battle.net that exist that we were supporting. And so we just didn't have that sort of freedom to, like, to like always, always be a consistent source, uh, resource for the game teams. And so about two years uh, ago, the Games User Research Group got created within QA. And uh, this is sort of like, you know, came to Blizzard. I was like, I want to do games research. And so when it, when it uh, was uh, a thing, uh, a wonderful man uh, who's maybe in the room decided to let me, give me a chance. And so I, I, I jumped ship on, uh, across the aisle there and, and joined Games User Research. All right. So um, real quick. I mean, this is a research group, but I want to kind of talk a little bit about the methods we used uh, in, this, uh, in the year that we did research for uh, Battle for Azeroth. And these are just the core methods. Like, as we're doing more and more research with the WoW team, um, we're applying different ones. But for sort of like building out research, these were the ones that we sort of leaned on. The first is usability, right? We probably all know that. Uh, play tests. And surveys were the three. So I'm going to kind of quickly go over kind of how they work for us, because there's like flavors, right? Just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, for usability, again, that one-on-one, -on -one, we have a living room simulator. Folks come in. Um, we're really just sort of uh, uh, highlighting, uh, you know, hey, talent points, right? If people don't notice them, that's a pretty significant problem. The one thing we make sure we do is because Blizzard has many game teams and our offices are, you know, we have lots of different buildings, we make sure we stream these to the game team's areas. So we set up a conference room. We let them be able to have live use. So they can just walk down from their desk to watch these. We feel like that's really important to sort of create uh, that ease of interacting with research. Um, so that's one thing we sort of highlighted. Um, play tests, we have a 20-person lab, which is really important for WoW because the content can go as far as group content, can get up to 20-person raids, right? So we want to make sure we're able to sort of facilitate those types of uh, research studies. And so for here, we're really capturing video, your telemetry data, as well as the uh, play test surveys that we give the players to get that uh, additional feedback. Um, and this was really great. Uh, as we did more of these, we really were able to layer in more and more data as needed to the game uh, designers to help them understand the problems better. And then finally, surveys. Obviously, these are really great for both. Uh, we have a lot of, Blizzard has a lot of employees, so a lot of them play WoW that aren't on the game team, so we make sure we interact with them, and this was a great way to do that. And then we use them as sort of like a pilot, and then we would expand to externals, and that worked really well for us. And so, again, one of the things we learned, too, is um, with these uh, surveys, um, WoW players uh, associate WoW, like, it's like, Class is so important for WoW players, right? It's the lens for which they see the game. And so in any survey you send to players, they want to talk about their class. And so while we, we want that feedback, sometimes we want other feedback. So if you don't sort of say, hey, here's a question that we're going to have for you to, to provide that class feedback, you're going to get class feedback in every question you get asked, right? You'd be like, oh, yeah, sure, difficulty, but it's really bad for monks. And you're like, cool. 
awesome. We, so you just kind of have to sort of make, create awareness of that, and that's sort of some, some stuff we're sort of layering there. All right, so QA. So when I joined, uh, Games User Research was in QA, and I was like, hmm, this is not something I've experienced before. What's this like? And so uh, I didn't realize how many amazing benefits we were going to have from this experience. And so Blizzard QA is really interesting because what it is is it's a more is, is a permanent sort of fixture, right? These folks are kind of seen as partners. They've been there, right? Like we have people on the WoW QA team that have been there 14, 15 years, right? As long as the game's been there. And so when you've been there that long, you built this sort of uh, uh, situation and, and sort of partnership. And so because of that, they have some amazing relationships with some of these game designers who have also been there for quite some time on World of Warcraft. And as research, when you're building out research, this is like, I can't say how awesome this is. And so because we were associated with them, we would go to sinks and we just, I just tag along to the dungeon sink. And so we'd sit with the QA team and you see this rapport between these groups, this sort of like uh, respected sort of um, situation where they're just like, like it's collaborative and there's no like demeaning in this happening. It's just, it was just really awesome. Um, and so this really accelerated what we were able to do because we could just lean on these and, and they, we just said, hey, trust these researchers. They're going to help you make a better game. Um, analysts are also subject matter experts. So with WoW, uh, on the QA team, we have what are called oracles. And an oracle is associated with each major feature. So a dungeon would have an oracle or a raid boss would have an oracle. So when we're getting ready to do a study on a specific dungeon, I know exactly who to go to. I say, hey, what's the stat status of the build? How... Um, uh, what's the uh, sort? Of, what questions are the designers having? They have that relationship with the designer. I'm like, hey, can you introduce us? Can we start having conversations? And uh, finally, they help set up builds. So, like, when running these studies, right? Like, wow, it's super complex, and there's lots of things that you have to sort of keep track of. And they just help, just shepherd us along to make sure we're doing a good job. And so this was really massively helpful. And like, they're just extra horsepower, right? So like we're running a study, you, you're running a play test, you know, you only got, we only had two researchers at the time working on this. So you have another person like, oh cool, I can go to the bathroom during a play test because we have another person. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna come back to that later, um, how awesome QA is. So let's talk about uh, what, what we learned here. Okay, so when we approached uh, doing research for World of Warcraft, we really wanted to understand, hey, a new expansion, there's lots of major features. We want to capture those sort of really impactful player experiences for these major features. So the ones we were really targeting were dungeons. There were going to be 10 dungeons. Again, for those that aren't familiar, that's five player content. You have a tank, a healer, and three damage dealers. Um, you typically have four bosses. They're, you know, they range in difficulty from normal through mythic. And so this is sort of some content we knew we wanted to sort of uh, uh, get feedback on. Raids, similar type of thing, up to 20 player. Um, content, again, normal to, or actually looking for raid up to mythic in terms of difficulty, uh, and the, in the range is 10 to 20 player. Uh, a new feature for this expansion was Warfronts. And this was sort of calling back to what even why WoW is here, right? Our Warcraft sort of uh, legacy uh, in terms of RTS games. And so really, like, they were trying to put in that, that sort of, that, uh, that type of gameplay. So collecting resources, building a base, um, recruiting troops, and then assaulting and attacking enemies, your uh, enemy bases. And so, like, how does that play in WoW, right? So that's something we, we knew. We were like, okay, this is going to be important to make sure this, like, does it feel like an RTS? And then finally, um, islands. No, that's not finally. There's one more finally. Um, so islands is 3v3 uh, where you're playing against either AR or other players. And these are procedurally generated content. And the cool thing about this that they introduced in this expansion was AI that was supposed to feel like real players. And so we were like, cool, we definitely want to see what people think about these, these, this new AI. Um, and then something we always sort of want to do is test that first hour, right? We know people are going to come back to the game who maybe ha uh, haven't played in a, in a few months or since the beginning of the expansion, and people who are continuing to play. So we want to understand that first hour. It, it, the smoother it is, the better off uh, we think the experience is going to be for players. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about these three dungeons, islands, and that intro experience. All right, so let's talk a little bit about dungeons. Um, so... One thing we sort of looked at, these are a staple of our expansion. Always there, something we've done since the beginning, right? And so um, for this, wait a minute, there you go. Uh, we felt this was an evergreen feature. And so we wanted to make sure um, 
that we approach the research for this in, in the, with the mindset of like we need to create a knowledge base for this going forward because we're going to continually do these. So we need to, to sort of create more awareness of this and, and understand these and sort of um, and, and it, it adapt, we adapt our approach to make sure we would set ourselves up to be more successful, successful in the future. Um, we also tested it early, um, so we're actually pretty early, and the majority came available during like a six-week period, so as most of you know, when you're testing games, you don't always get this really nice sort of set of time to do everything. Luckily, the dungeon design team gave us a little more uh, breathing room, so we were able to get a lot of these in uh, in a short period of time. All right, so I wanted to tie back to what I talked a little bit earlier about QA and how they acted as accelerators. So this is the sort of best example of that. So with this, uh, with the WoW QA team, they have a raid group, and these are test analysts who are also mythic raiders. And what that means is they are playing the dungeons and raids at this very high-end sort of difficulty. Um, and they also tested it at sort of normal and heroic and other difficulties as well. But as most of us know, when you're really good at something, it's particularly difficult to pretend you're not good, right? And so um, when we kind of look at our player base, Right? So we have this cool graph, um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with item level, item level is sort of like gear progression in World of Warcraft. And so the higher your item level, the uh, more difficult content you're completing, so like the high-end mythic raids. And so what we saw is the mythic raiders were sort of living in this sort of end of the bell curve here. And so we came to the dungeon designers and said, hey, we can target these people. We can go out there and get exactly the people that are completing normal dungeons, throw up at normal dungeons, heroic, heroic. And so they, because they had this experience with these WoW QA raid team, it really was conceptually very similar to a playtest, right? The QA raid team plays the content, the designer's watching them play, they're having conversations. At the end, the QA raid team provides sort of like an overarching, like, hey, here's what we thought, right? Yeah, they don't do surveys and do some of the stuff that we do and help remove bias and all that good stuff, but essentially, conceptually, the dungeon and raid designers understood. So it was actually a really quick jump from what they were doing to what we suggested. And so within, I wanna say two, maybe three weeks, we were actually on the calendar, which like, for me, I was like, this is the easiest research I've ever had to do. Like, I don't have to fight to like get in on the calendar. It was really kind of amazing. It did set us up for future troubles because we, we got a little confident, uh, overconfident. Um, but this was awesome. So Accelerator QA, yes. All right. Um, so I, as any good research, you want to know what questions you're trying to answer. We got a bunch of feedback, a bunch of different questions, but I wanted to sort of bubble it down to two sort of main areas. The first, uh, and these came from our, the senior lead designers for the dungeon raid teams, um, how do they feel about dungeon bosses? Like overall, like, you know, are they difficult? Do they understand the mechanics? Or just, you know, like, but generally, like, how are these new dungeon bosses? And then the other one was the minions between the bosses, right? So you typically dungeon, how the dungeon works. You fight a bunch of minions, you get to the boss, fight the boss, and then more minions, the next boss, that, that's typically how it works. So they want to know, hey, because sometimes these are affectionately called trash. Uh, the trash can be really annoying. So we want to make sure we're capturing that if that's the case. All right. And so for this, we really felt that playtests worked great because we had uh, a bunch of bosses, the builds we knew were going to be in a pretty stable state because uh, the QA team was uh, helping us get them to that state. And yeah, it was, it worked. we felt this would be a great opportunity. Okay, so what did we learn? We quickly identified which bosses weren't, weren't doing so well, right? Um, and so what was cool about this is we also were able to provide that supporting evidence because we're doing playtests, we have the videos, we have the telemetry, we have uh, the playtest surveys. And so let's sort of kind of walk through what that is. So here we have the fun and difficulty scores for a dungeon. And each one of these colors is a different boss. And so you can kind of see I don't know why these are have numbers, but uh, the purple uh, boss there is not um, scoring as high and has the high, a uh, very high difficulty. And so, yeah, that's weird. Um, and so with, uh, with that, we were like, okay, let's dig into the next layer of questions that we asked. And so we have three different sort of secondary questions, and they're about the boss mechanics. And so we're curious about the clarity. So do you understand what the boss is doing to you, right? Can you see what's happening, or are you just getting killed by something you don't know? And so we want to make sure that was there. So we scored a little bit low there. But the second one's really where we want to kind of focus. And this is the player's ability to respond to what the boss is doing. So you may be able to see what's happening, but you can't actually respond to it. So in this case, we're like, whoa. Why is this so low? So the reason, like, okay, yeah, this is super obvious, right? But what, what this does is it helps us sort of limit how much time we're spending because we have to do quickly. We have to balance that speed and depth. This is like sort of like these 
posts that are telling us to dig deeper. And so then we would look at video and then we would look at um, this other stuff and then create that picture for the designers to show them exactly what's happening to then allow them the best opportunity to, to make those changes. And what was really cool here is this boss for the QA raid team felt, they felt it was really easy. So the designer went back and made changes and added this additional mechanic that then when we tested was nearly impossible. Only one team beat it and the rest of them tried multiple times and they just could never beat it. So it was really sort of a validation of like, hey, we're providing this uh, additional layer of like ch check-in and feedback. Cool. Okay, another thing we sort of uh, looked at is deaths per dungeon or dust per player per dungeon. So the first two were like, cool, not too bad. Four, that's like one per boss, right? Not too bad. We saw a big spike. We're like, oh, Lord, they're going to be really, this is gonna, they're going to hate this dungeon. The reality is they didn't. And so for us, it's sort of kind of highlighting again, telemetry, if you just look at that, you're, you're potentially setting yourself up for failure in terms of like actual player experience. So just sort of highlighting like other stuff we're looking at, other data we're collecting to make sure we, we uh, give a good picture to the designers. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what we learned from doing this sort of uh, round of playtest for the designers. Um, for us, because we were brand new, improving the process was really important. We got to learn how to set up and run, uh, run playtests for World of Warcraft, which is like, wow, it's super complex. Setting up builds, getting servers ready, getting them stable. And actually where we got the most, a lot of benefit is with World of Warcraft, players have uh, customized their UI, right? It's part of the game. When you come in for a play test, you don't have that available. We can't let you use that because we're setting up random accounts. And so our process, we really kind of, kind of uh, truncated how long it took to set up that for players. So we ha gave them more time to give us feedback on the content rather than spending 30 minutes setting up their character. So we really sort of shrunk that. So that was really one of the, the examples of how the process improved. We also really improved understanding what useful data was. So having these, all these play tests run with the designers, we kept reviewing things. And every time we did one, I, we would layer in additional data. And um, partially because we just learned from them, like, oh, this was useful. And sometimes we were just like, it was sort of that like push, not pull, right? We were pushing additional data in front of them, seeing data in front of them to see what, that respond, what they responded to. Um, so let me give you an example of that. So role is uh, something that we didn't realize was really important to the designers. And so the roles are tank, healer, and damage dealer. And in this case, we broke them up into melee, so up close and personal, and ranged. And so you can see on the left uh, the overall. Um, and I want to highlight like tank and melee are at the bottom in terms of fun, and the ranged are at higher. And then over here, though, you're like, well, why are tank thinks it difficult and melee thinks it's not so difficult? Well, when we look back at the data, it was minions. So the, the trash minions, they stun you. And so for melee, it's just like, oh, I can't do damage. It's not like causing me much pain, but I'm, I just can't do what I'm, my job. Tanks, their job is making sure everybody attacks them. When they're stunned, they can't do that. And so they're, they're, they're like, oh, man, now I can't do my job, and other people are getting hit, and I'm stunned, and I can't do anything. So this is something where we're sort of looking at this data to make sure we understand about minions and, and sort of the importance of role uh, for these designers. And really what hit home for me was when they said, you know, like with dungeons, you can queue up, right, as a sort of random and get a random group. And if there's a dungeon that a tank hates the entire dungeon, that tank will probably quit if he gets that dungeon. So like you get a random dungeon, you're like, okay, cool, the tank's here. And it's like, oh, the tank hates it. They leave. The other four players don't get to play that content. And so they really want to make sure that isn't happening. Okay. So let's talk about islands. So this is a new feature. Um, again, 3v3. Uh, AI or player versus player. Uh, you can do any role combination, uh, so healers, tanks, any, any sort of combination. And again, it's a race, right? You're trying to fill up your bar, beat the other team. Um, and this we tested super, super early, like builds falling apart. Uh, the comment I heard was like, if it's breaking, that means you're testing it right about when you should be. And I was like, oh, cool. It doesn't feel great, but yeah, awesome. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, we, we knew we were uh, uh, doing a good job there, but this is something I'm going to kind of come back to later as something that we learned. Um, so what were our questions, right? So the producer was somebody we had worked with, was the same producer from the dungeon and raids, and he was really interested about the AI. How, do, how does it feel to play against this new, a, new AI? The designers were interested in, do they understand it's a race, right? We're testing it really early. Is that coming through? Because that's really an important part of this. And so pretty simple questions. 
And we identified playtests as sort of the, the, the method that we were going to use to sort of get at this, to learn these, to figure out these questions. OK. This is a lot. So we got a, a good old scatter plot. And this TV makes it look like there's even more lines. Cool. Um, so each dot is a match that our players played in the playtest, right? Each color is the different AI. So we had three AI. So you have the blue, which is PVP focused. So if they saw you, they were coming after you. You have yellow, which is PVE. They would sort of avoid you, but if you fought them, they would fight back. And then both, it means they would do whatever was worth the most to them to win. So they would know like, oh, you're worth more to me. I'm going to kill the PV you as a player. Or this mob is worth more. I'm going to kill the mob. And so what you're looking at, the pink section is where players lost. So it, the further down you go, the worse they got beat. When you go uh, in the green section, that is where uh, players won. And obviously, the opposite. The higher they went, the more they won, right? So the x-axis is time. And so the further to the right, the longer the match. So we started to notice some clusters here. So AI had some early sort of stompings of the players, right? And you're like, OK, cool. Uh, we also noticed this blue group up here on the right. And so what we found was this, the PVP focus group, you, we learned that as um, AI, you got more points for um, defeating them than they got for defeating you. So if you were equally skilled and just kind of traded deaths, you would eventually win, which is what this sort of group did, right? Um, and so it wasn't always an amazing experience because obviously they just kept coming after you. Once they found you, it's like they knew where you were and they were just always on you. And so great, you won, but it maybe didn't feel like a win. Um, cool, what else? Um, so other data we looked at. So because we did um, play tests and we did surveys, we looked at open-ended feedback because we knew we wanted that layer of like, how are, what are the sort of responses to these AI? So for some, the AI was that high point, right? They're like, oh man, this AI was kind of cool. Um, and one in particular was called out, the Horde Pirates, which is the PVP group. And so here's a quote that sort of summarizes the experience, right? And I, it's, we, we called out particularly memorable. Not, some were positive and some were negative. And this person's sort of like, ironically, I like the harder horde, S Sneaky Pete, who was an undead rogue, who was invisible, and would just stab you in the back and yell, Sneaky Pete. And it was, yeah, people loved that. <laughs> he was both the worst and the best thing about Island. What a troll. By the end of the pirates, I had personal vendettas against them. The others I liked fighting, but didn't want to utterly destroy like Sneaky Pete. And so like, you're like, okay, so it's best and worst, right? It's like, okay, cool. I like, I really liked hating them, but like, they're really annoying. So you're just like, okay, well, at least we were able to provide that sort of layer of like emotions to the designers to say, if this is what you're going for, you nailed it. Um, what was interesting, though, because they were PvP-focused, the players got to interact with them the most. If you're PvE, you may not actually interact with that group. And so they did not, you didn't get as much feedback on them because of, they just did their job and stayed away from you. And we made sure they understood that. OK, so what did we learn? Don't read this. It's blurred out on purpose. Don't try. It's too hard. If you can, I'll give you bonus points. I can't read it. I made the thing. All right, so. Um, so this is an example of an Excel that I created. And so I looked at a bunch of stuff. I looked at role comp, class comp, starting location, because the, the enemy could start in different locations from each other, close to far, scores, player skill level. I looked at island events, because there's random events that happen on islands. I looked at a ton of stuff, right? And I was like, ah, oh, awesome. I have tons of data to share with these designers. They're going to love me. And so how did this make islands better? Yeah, it didn't impact it in time. And there's two failures that happened here. One, the findings were delayed. And this wasn't necessarily all our fault because the issue is the meeting needed to get taken over by another meeting from the game team. And so they pushed it out. And it was actually at GDC last year. So that means it got pushed out even further. And so we really, once we presented the data, we were really divorced from the development process. Again, we tested so early, that quick, speedy, iterative sort of approach to research was sort of missing. And as any good researcher, when you're given more time, what do you do? you spend more time doing an analysis, right? So I went a little too deep, right? And what was funny is, I remember in the moment during the presentation is when I realized I had gone too deep. And I was sitting in this room with tons of designers and they were like, what is this, right? Like, it just was too much, right? Like, it was a lot of cool data, but it was just like, I, they didn't have this specific thing to grab onto of like, this is the thing I need to care about, right? And so, yeah, it's just, you know, yeah, whoops. 
But the good thing is we learned a lot about islands. And because WoW is a very complex and large game, islands are part of the whole ecosystem of World of Warcraft. And we, uh, what we learned was really beneficial for future research. So it wasn't like, oh, okay, crap, this sucked. And we learned, don't do that, right? Which is also very important. So one of the things I, I sort of uh, want to kind of highlight is we leaned on the producer a lot in this case to help us understand what we should do and sort of what questions that we needed to answer, and we skipped that relationship step. Another thing, because it's a new feature, a new QA analyst was assigned to this project or to this feature, and they hadn't had time to build that relationship with this designer. And so we couldn't lean on them either. And so because of that, we just sort of like, we were riding high on like dungeons. We're like, we're doing really good. And it just, yeah, we just kind of overconfident and didn't work. Don't do that. Um, and then, yeah, super obvious, avoid unnecessary depth, right? Like, especially early on, they just needed that quick, like, here's the three things, take this and go. Um, and yeah, I think what was interesting about Dungeons is we started very small and then we just layered on. So it, 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 while at the end it had a lot of depth, we kept it like sort of appropriately uh, uh, within their sort of ability to sort of grok it, right? Like we didn't layer it all at once. It was like, oh, here's a little more and here's a little bit more. And so they could keep up with us. Whereas this, it was just like, I gave them the fire hose. Okay, so I want to touch a little bit about using playtests in general. Um, so like the insights that we gained, they worked great for a lot of things, right? Like we got really meaningful insights quickly when we used them quickly. Um, and that clearer picture was really important for us. So tying in like, hey, all right, we know this boss is bad. Let's let them look at it. Because we had one example where there was a specific fight where they really, like, once we showed them the progression of the players, because they died to it multiple times, we showed them a specific example of a group, sort of how they learned the fight. And they're like, this is awesome. It tells us what they're doing, how they're thinking about this. And so it was really insightful for the designers, and they can make decisions based on that. So we just sort of layered that in as needed when, when we had those sort of issues with some of the bosses. Um, and the unexpectedly, sort of like the importance of role and sort of how playtests were really great at sort of highlighting that. Because like re realistically, we'd have to run a ton of playtests in order to do at the class level. Role f sort of filled that gap and sort of is like, okay, generally like, yes, tanks are happy, healers are happy, that kind of stuff. All right. Next, uh, Battle for Azeroth intro. Okay, creating context. Um, so we tested the first 60 minutes, and we, um, we waited until the beta launched. Um, we did this because we wanted e external players, because we knew that once we got it to the beta, anybody could see it. The team would be less sort of concerned about leaks and stuff like that. And being a new team, we didn't have that sort of trust of like, oh, when you guys do research, it's, and the world isn't going to find out, right? Um, and so they were happy to have us uh, use externals in this situation. So again, this is something we want to do every expansion because we care about uh, making sure that first intro is really important or uh, really well, uh, well done, and we tested during the development, but kind of near the end. So we really had to focus on doing this quickly, um, and so um, we ended up doing usability for this. Uh, so the designers, so what was cool about this is I got all the designers, and even some I hadn't worked with before, into a room and said, hey, we're getting close to the launch of the game here. What's the things you care most about? And this sort of is, is why we did this, is they were like, hey, what are that first hour? Like, what are the challenges and the rough spots in, in our sort of game? Um, and they were really curious, both for current and churn players, because again, people are going to come back to the expansion. What's that experience like? Um, and so what did we learn? This study had immediate impact. And what I mean by immediate is like literally, we tested Wednesday. Thursday changes were in the beta. And so it was really awesome to see. And, and, and from, a, uh, from the fact that we learned several different uh, player experiences, both on a UI side, so maybe there's a UI that was just unclear, people didn't know what they needed to do, or an actual like, hey, sometimes like payers just forget things and you just need to give them those gentle sort of nudges of like, oh, hey, you remember you can do this and this is gonna make your life easier. Oh, cool. Um, and what was nice is because we set up two rounds of this, we were able to validate those fixes, and that was also really awesome. Uh, so what did we learn? Uh, so one of the things um, was when players come back and they create a boosted character, you get boosted up, and part of that process is selecting your specialization, right? So here the players selected what class and what race they're playing. They're trying to finish, and it actually says here, choose a talent specialization for your character, which is here. 
funnily enough, you can only make one choice, right? So it's really not a choice, but they didn't see it. And so they never actually clicked on it. And you're just like, the, the, the designer's like, why are we having them make a choice that doesn't matter and it's just causing confusion? Let's just make it for them. Because you can change it afterwards, but in the, the sort of initial boost, they really wanted them just like, hey, we're going to create this very curated content around this specific specialization. And then after that, you can do whatever you want. So this was just like an easy, like, okay, yeah, we need to fix this. And we found several of these. Um, I had some cool videos. I'm able to show them uh, due to sort of tech issues. But essentially, one of the videos really highlighted um, one of the players. We had a player who had over 12,000 hours with World of Warcraft. And he had just got a quest uh, in the Horde city um, on the Horde side where he's going with famous NPCs, right? Faction NPCs. And he's going to assault the Alliance capital. And in this uh, uh, quest, he's super excited because he's like, this is my favorite type of quest. I'm like part of the story and we're doing this really awesome thing. And he's talking about this as they're sort of walking to sort of to the next part of the quest. And uh, at one point, the NPCs disappear and he then proceeds to get lost. He goes to the quest point. He's like looking for it. And what he doesn't realize is it's actually above him. And he spends five minutes, no kidding, five minutes flying around. He goes like just off in the middle of nowhere, he abandons the quest, re-accepts the quest. I ended up having to go in and saying, hey, it's above you, and he felt super embarrassed. And he had 12,000 hours, so it's not like this is something that was completely new to him. And so they saw that, and they're just like, yeah, we gotta fix that. So what they did was, as the, play, as the NPCs came out of the inn where they sort of talked about what they're gonna do, they had to mount up and start flying. And then that's all it took, and then the person took over and fixed the problem. So again, like highlighting, like just, you don't need 400 people to show you that that needs to be fixed, right? Okay, what did we learn? All right, um, so in this case, right, the reason this was so successful and, and so immediately impactful was the designers came and watched the sessions, right? So creating those opportunities for them to see it was, was all that it took. Um, and for the new designers who were unfamiliar with research, this created really good buy-in. They were just like, cool, that looks really awesome. And I, like it's, you, they didn't argue with what, you're, what they were seeing. And so um, in this slide, you kind of see, this is your sort of ideal uh, designer meeting. They're watching people play the game. This is Photoshop, by the way. Um, watching people uh, uh, play the game and having those conversations. And, uh, that's, and then as researchers, we always have someone in the room to help facilitate any questions they may have to the moderator. You're learning a lot about their, how they think about things and, and sort of any other sort of problem spaces they're thinking about. Um, so let's talk quickly about sort of insights for usability. In this case, that quick and dirty worked amazing, right? Like we didn't spend two, two weeks creating the study design. We were just like, all right, just plop them in front of it, let's go. Um, and again, you don't really need that huge sample size. It just, this just works really well. Okay, almost done. Um, all right, things to remember. QA. So now what I want to highlight here a little bit too is for us, QA was this accelerator. It could be somebody different for your organization. Customer support. Um, I don't know who else. Uh, like there could be other people that just have these really strong relationships that if you're new as a research team to an organization, you know, leverage that um, and, and sort of uh, those relationships. Uh, it worked great for us because we we're a part of that organization and we sort of benefit each other, right? Like we help collect, uh, help them collect feedback for play tests they do internally on the WoW teams or other game teams um, and sort of help out there. Um, you can't really skip time and effort, right, in terms of building relationships, especially at Blizzard. Like, this is sort of a, it's a very important thing to sort of build those, especially with the designers. And this is a step you really can't skip unless you have QA accelerating you. Um, so to just spend that time. And even when you do have that acceleration, you still have to build that sort of awareness around what game designers um, really are trying to, to solve and what problems they have. Because there's so many constraints, especially with WoW, it's, got a, it's, a, it's an older game, the technical sort of capabilities, it's, it's sort of like you got to know what that is to help provide better feedback. And then always invite them into research process, right? And for this, like, we're, we're working on some surveys and we're actually, ha you know, using our internal um, employees, we're sort of working with the team to sort of say, hey, let's do this really low risk, low barrier survey that, um, 
that there's just like, we're just gonna send it to employees so we don't have to worry about it leaking. And then we can sort of get that feedback and say, hey, is this data that's useful to you? And then we sort of work with them to understand how we can change the survey. And sort of like this is nice pilot process of both building in more buy-in because you're working with the designers and getting their feedback. And then also making sure the quality of the data is good. And the cool thing is at the end, when we finally did send out an external survey, we already had this cool runway of how to do the analysis because we did it on a smaller data set. Once you expand out, you kind of know what, they, what data they want. And it was just really easy to do it quickly, which is, again, really important. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I think we're going to have a microphone somewhere. It's in the corner. We won't put you in the corner. Don't worry. This isn't dirty dancing. Hey, my wife will love that joke. And if you don't want to ask a public question, you can ask in private after. Hi there. Um, so I had some questions about recruitment methods. Oh, sure. So obviously, WOW has like been around for a while, and skill levels vary a ton. Yes. So what do you do to address, OK, I'm running usability with five people. Uh, do you that, take into account like they've been a mythic raider or not? Or this is a great point. I think with this, we sort of took the sort of bell, sort of like that middle part of the bell curve for this, right? Because, yeah, I mean it's a good point. I think with usability, you can kind of get away with like if it's a problem they don't know. I mean, and, and it, that was the thing. Like we brought in um, somebody who was more sort of like had just did his first mythic rating, and he struggled with some of the same problems. And we brought in somebody who was like just a transmogger and loves like going out doing old raids to collect cool gear and really wasn't pushing sort of hard in content. And they both had similar issues. So, but it, I mean, it's a great point. Yeah, with usability, you do have to be careful. But I mean, I, I think. With the types of findings that we've had, they were um, appropriate to sort of, we felt confident that they were legitimate. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. That was a great question. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, for just a bit of context, I worked in QA for years before going in user research. Cool. And so my question with that was when I did move to the user research more part of things, I was surprised at, to see how much those two didn't work together as much sure. as I as expected. Sure. And uh, my question for that would be, first of all, how did how did you approach the, the building that relationship, first of all, with QA and user research, which is, the I would say, in my personal opinion, the least challenging um, aspect of things, but then selling that to the designers as you know, like when you conduct those, those those studies or like some, when you have some data, new data or whatever, and how do you present that and they don't dismiss it um, because sometimes there's a bit of a resistance when it comes to. Sure. So so how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, right? And so um, I think in terms of, sort of answer your first question about like building the relationship with QA, luckily we have a QA director who is the reason where our, the games user research group exists. And so having that sort of a, a stakeholder at that level helps you understand, helps you sort of, it, it becomes part of, of the culture within QA. And one of the things, and, and I'm sure you can attest to this, is QA is sort of like, I don't know, like they're just this humble sort of just, I'm going to go get them attitude and sort of working with them. It was just like, as research, you sort of also have that, like, we're going to do whatever it takes to get the right type of data to the designers in the right time. Right. And so it just was, I don't know, it felt very natural um, for me. Um, and so it, it took a little time. I think the hardest part was just creating awareness of what we did. And so I think in retrospect, I would probably spend more time with QA and sort of have additional context creation sort of meetings and sort of create more awareness around how research works to uh, uh, build those relationships more quickly. And then they can understand where we fit within sort of um, the development process from their perspective, right? So then they can help shepherd us in and say, hey, designers, now's the time you should interact with these folks. And then when they bring us into these meetings, I can then take over and say, cool, thanks. And then we work together to make sure what we're providing is, is good data and good feedback to the designers. Thank you. But it's, yeah, it's, a ch it's challenging for sure. Hey, Hi. for the talk. Uh, uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, you said that about the survey that you were uh, doing them with uh, both interns and externs players. And so I was wondering, well, uh, oh, did you did you make them feel the same and analyze uh, the data for both uh, interns and externs at the same times? Or, well, how did you do uh, to, to recruit the interns and et cetera, about the whole process? 
Great question. So what we did was it was a, a survey that we sent out to uh, specific classes. And so we, we targeted a specific class internally and said, okay, anybody that fits sort of these sort of basic variables of you're this class, you have a character at this level, you're in this sort of item level range, which sort of tells us how far you've gotten in the game. Um, and then we would send it to them and then get that initial feedback. And then we did, we used the same type of thing, but then use externals because we use, we're able to use our internal databases and sort of what we capture about players to help, uh, identify the right players. So we're, we're getting that group. And then we just expanded the number of classes out, um, based on what the designers were interested in. Okay. And um, sorry, I had a follow-up question. Sure. Um, did you, uh, exclude, uh, some interns, so uh, due to their background or such, because this is something we are doing, so I was wondering if you were doing the same and uh, which were the criteria for uh, including or not uh, the intern in the study. We did. So we excluded anybody that worked on the game team. So like, but if you worked on, you know, like we have a, we have a large QA team, but as long as you weren't on the WoW QA team, we would use you. Um, if you were in, you know, we really sort of targeted non-game you know, teams is great. So like HR, all, the, all those sort of support groups are really, really sort of good people to bring in because we bring them in for usability and other things as sort of pilots and that that works really well um but yeah like we did exclude some um but like again it's like part of it is like um blizzard is sort of unique in that like the players that are there are just so pa like you just see so many passionate people about the games that we felt like they were a, a reasonably close because you kind of like for us it was more important to build that um sort of process with the game team and the game designers and then and then say okay is this cool is this going to work and then go out to the right audience and then use that data as more the okay this is what you need to listen to but that's helping us make sure we're doing it right mm -hmm. thanks a lot for your answers you're, you're welcome great questions <laughs> so uh, i'm at one quick is somebody yell at me when i'm out of time is that me okay oh perfect thank you <laughs> go ahead sorry thank that's you fine. um so I have a question about the idea of the, uh, you know, when you're live streaming the the uh, the play test or these usability studies. Um, I've heard some concerns from other like experienced researchers that they're worried that, you know, a, a developer might kind of like come in and out or see maybe watch one person come to a conclusion and then like dismiss research results later, or they're worried about not being able to kind of organize all the findings. Is that something you either were concerned about or experienced? Or? We we are concerned about it. I mean, it's one of the reasons we have someone in the room, a more senior person, to make sure that's not happening and creating more context. And we always follow up with like, hey, we know you saw some of these things, but but here's the actual, all the data. Now, if it's something we agree with, it, you know, in the moment, we're like, this is a problem, we're going to sort of, you know, let them in some situations, maybe you're right, like the designers can potentially just roll off. But in this instance with World of Warcraft, we didn't have a lot of that happening. Um, and typically, um, the, by being in the room with them, we were able to sort of uh, avoid some of that, uh, at least we, we haven't hit it yet. I'm not saying we won't, but it, at least we, we haven't run into it yet. So that was a great question. Hi there. Um, so I'm just curious about uh, any limitations that you might have identified with, say, running well, raids or dungeons with people who may not necessarily play together outside of play tests. Yes. Um, and if you deem them to be acceptable kind of limitations, because like, you know, I used to play WoW and do dungeons and raids and you do it with a group, right? Yes. And yeah, there's a, we had this one experience where we had this dungeon where the trash leading up to the very first boss was like crazy difficult. And one group died probably like 20 times. And you know, if you're in a dungeon group where you die more than five times in the first part, you're out. Like everybody leaves. Um, in terms of like, uh, I mean, that's a good question. Um, because we didn't, we, we try to target similar groups and we knew like grouping up uh, randomly as part of the game. I, I mean, it's sort of, a, it, there's definitely a limitation. To be honest, I don't know if I have a great answer for you right now. I think my brain is sort of fried a little bit. Yeah, it's like, if I'm honest. how do you sometimes separate group feedback versus content feedback, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a good point, right? We did look at like, so one of the, one of the data points that we create is we have a chart where we have all the different groups and how often they competed or they, um, 
how many attempts they made per boss, and if they defeated each boss. And then we would dig into those, those players and say, okay, are these the players that are giving all these specific ratings that are sort of bad, and is it because of something specific to the players? And we did sort of make sure we have that sort of nice range, and they are all sort of similar sort of skill levels. And we didn't want to sort of completely ignore if their feedback, if they were having problems, because the reality is that's probably going to happen on live, and sort of val it sort of validates like our approach in the sense that like, hey, we have these... Um, it's different, like, if you've ever done it, you know there's, like, you could do it once and immediately do it again and have completely different experiences, right? You get a tank that's, like, geared out the wazoo, and you're just like, I don't even have to play, right? I can just slash follow, and I'm good. But, yeah, I mean, in terms of, like, I think, again, we're trying to balancing speed with sort of what we're doing, and, and, you know, it's sort of a limitation we sort of accept and sort of do our best to sort of counterbalance it with, with um, how we're looking at the data and the data we're presenting. But it's, I mean, it's a very good point. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Um, so, you, you know, talked about a lot of different studies here, right? Sure. And there have been quite a few expansions now for a while. Sure. So, uh, and we talked about like a database of past uh, research before, you know, early on, um, previous talk. So, so how do you use the stuff you've already got on the stuff coming up? That's, I think that's where we're sort of figuring that out as we're going right now, actually. It's a lot of like with dungeons, understanding sort of like one of the things we learned was um, difficulty doesn't necessarily, is independent of fun. So one of the things we saw is we had two bosses in one dungeon where they had literally the same fun score, pretty high fun scores. One had a really fairly low difficulty, had the lowest difficulty, and one had the highest difficulty. And so that's stuff we're sort of trying to dig into more. And I think we're going to adapt um, playtests going forward to better sort of dig into that and sort of understand where's the optimal challenge, right? I think there was a guy who gave a talk last year who had a great talk about that, and I want to pick his brain if he's here. Um, but anyway, you're, there's definitely... Um, the how we're doing that is, is, is something we're defining right now, and we'll we'll yeah. I don't have a great answer for that, but yeah, it's uh, it's something we're interested in. Okay, follow up. Thank you. Yes. Um, how did any research that was done on the previous expansions uh, influence the decision, to, like for methods on this? On oh, that's a good question. So, the, like the pre, like to kind of make to bring a little clarity. So, the previous expansion work that we did typically was like stuff what I did when I was on Balnet, and so it was very sort of focused on like tutorials, like the boosted experience was other stuff that we did research on, and so what it did was create awareness around like specifically the usability method. And um, when we sort of, uh, because it created that awareness, it was sort of an easy sort of um, path to say, hey, this is research that we've done in the past, we could do something similar. And it sort of helps us create buy-in and create more awareness throughout all, because like, WoW's a big team, right? They have just tons and tons of different sort of sub-teams, not tons, obviously, but like several different sub-teams and sort of creating awareness from the dungeon team to the gear team to the class team to the PvP, you know, like we just, it helped us a lot there. Um, and so just trusting that we can give you data that's useful in a, in a timely manner. Um, and I think the thing that was really helpful for us is it really highlighted how different players approach WoW, right? Like, and that's one of the things we're really trying to layer in more is like creating more insights from, you know, like, Wow, there's a ton of people who play WoW, and they play it a bajillion different ways. And so we're really trying to to create more awareness around that and sort of highlight that to the the game designers because like you just lose sight of that, right? And we were trying to design a game for, you know, everybody from raiders to sort of people who'd want to do transmog or pet battles or what have you. It's hard. And so the more we can sort of say, hey, this is a group they like this, and this is a group like we're trying to help with that without sort of telling them what to do, just inspiring them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you guys have had PTR forever. You yes. do surveys at BlizzCon for years. Yes. But your talk is kind of highlighting how this is a very new function. So how did this evolve? Who was digesting that feedback before? It's a good question. <laughs> um, so PTRs, um, I, I don't think... So like PTR feedback typically came in the form of, of forums. And so like a lot of feedback came through that. And it's pretty hit and miss, 
right? Um, I know from the QA side, they're always looking at bugs that PTR that, that they get from the PTR because we're trying to say, hey, can we identify additional issues with the game earlier through this? And they weren't having so much success. Um, in terms of BlizzCon surveys, that was something our the Battle.net team worked with them on. And so we would uh, engage with them and say, hey, we're happy to help with this. We would create it. And then we would give that feedback back to them um, through just sort of similar channels in terms of we set up the survey, iterate with them, you know, set it up for BlizzCon, uh, do the data analysis, and then give that report to them. Um, so that's like, so while it's, yeah, I don't want to overstate that it's new, it's, it's definitely, we've been doing research for them, but it hasn't had that consistency, right? And so there weren't anything for them to be like, oh, okay, There's, there was no sort of push to be like, this is a part of this process, right? And so that's where this new team, the Games User Research Focus team, is sort of building it out and saying, okay, now we're here, we're not going anywhere, how can we help? Cool. Yeah. And quick follow-up question. Sure. I know WoW is probably one of, if not the most studied game in academia. Sure. So I'm just curious, like, do you guys look at that research? Do you d use it at all? And we, we have, I mean, like, um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> Nick Yee, love that guy, right? He's yeah. A big, yeah. Um, uh, like, so um, my background isn't as academic as probably people in this room. I'm very more pra practical practical yeah that's the right word um and so for me i lean a lot on just like hey this is what we're doing i'm here to help i want to work with the game designers understand the problems build that relationship work with them luckily we have one of people like nikki who's in the room who's making sure i know what i'm doing and so uh and other managers in the past and so we're definitely layering that in more we only had two folks at the early stages we didn't do as much to be honest and now we are doing much more um but yes it is something we're very interested in and like like the reality is like when we're building this out like they they don't know how to use this and so really we're just trying to get them to like want to use this right and so this worked pretty well for us and while we did have some fumbles we definitely sort of understand like okay now here, here's an approach that we're using and that's working out for us and yeah we'll, we'll see how it goes well, hopefully i'll be back in a year or two and have even more cool stuff yeah, yeah. Cool. thank you yeah good questions thank you all right we done okay good all right thanks everybody